Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Black Women's Collective Panel. I am Daryl Cumberdance, the moderator of the session, and as soon as I remind you of a few critical details, I will briefly introduce our acclaimed panelists. A second one will be joining us shortly. On behalf of all of us here and everyone enjoying this festival of the book, we want to thank David and Michelle Badalci and all of the other sponsors, partners, hosts, and volunteers, everyone who has contributed to the planning, organizing, and facilitating of this event. Let me pause also to remind you to make donations to keep the festival mostly free. Use the QR code provided or visit the link provided. We have one of the most friendly, successful, affordable, and esteemed book festivals in the nation, and its continuing growth rewards us all. I have been enjoying this festival since many of you were probably still in school, and I'm here to testify that it has gotten more impressive and awe-inspiring over all of its 30-year history. And finally, before we begin, I want to remind you that we on this panel represent ourselves. We do not speak on behalf of the Virginia Festival of the Book, Virginia Humanities, or the University of Virginia. And now a few introductory remarks. If I had any semblance of a pleasing voice, I would open this session dramatically, intoning these lines that you all probably know. Lift every voice and sing, till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Ethel Morgan Smith and Courtney Thorson, the two scholars, poets, writers, activists that you are about to hear, have pursued very different projects. But both of their projects remind us of the necessity of lifting every voice in the quest for liberty. They both remind us of those voices that built on a tradition while bravely and optimistically pursuing goals to secure today's community. Their remarkable books share with us the intriguing stories of many individuals whose brave voices shaped our world and our culture and lifted us to rise toward a new day that they made possible. My job here perhaps should be to mention some particulars about Ethel Morgan Smith's path to grace. There's Ethel. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I should be mentioning some particulars about uh, uh, Ethel Morgan Smith's path to grace, reimagining the civil rights movement, and Courtney Thorson's The Sisterhood. How, hold it up, please. How on that <laughs> How a network of black women writers changed American culture. However, I won't be mentioning that because I want you to hear directly, <clears throat> unsullied by any interpretations I might interject, hear directly the powerfully poetic, dynamic, authoritative voices of Ethel and Courtney. These two divas with whom I am honored to share the stage I wrestled with that word because I want you to take it in its original sense. Goddesses, female deities, divine inspiration, these divas whose incredible research presents committed voices in the civil rights movement and in American literary history. Voices that will inform and lift us all. Ethel and Courtney, lift your voices. Lift the voices of those whose songs you share. Lift those voices till earth and heaven ring, ring right here in Charlottesville, Virginia. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to have to kill Teresa. <laughs> I, Teresa is a friend of mine, and she was going to get me a ride from the airport in Richmond. She sends the person to the airport in Charlottesville. <laughs> so that's, I'm not usually like this, but anyway. <laughs> so I wanted to say that. But thank you. Um, you told me to hold this close. Um, Path of Grace uh, came about in the late 1990s, I guess. You know when people start to die, and then another, you know, it's like that with movie stars. One will die and then another one. It was happening with uh, our civil rights icons. And one day I heard thought, well, what can I do uh, to help this? I'm sure there's something I can do. So I kept talking about it to people and making notes and that kind of thing. So I decided that uh, my project would be about people who we don't know. Uh, most of them. We don't know. We've never heard of them. A few of the people in the book you do know, but most of them you have never heard of them. But they were these foot soldiers. So I wanted my book to be a personal kind of book. And when I say that, I mean something like this. One of the people I write about is Shirley Chisholm, and we know who she is, right? But I interviewed uh, Susan Curry Perry, who is her legislative aide to get another aspect of her, to write things about her that you've never read before. So that was what I wanted to do. And after I finished the project interviewing people, I ran into another problem because it didn't quite work for me. So I needed something to keep these, these voices together. So I made a decision that I thought that, oh, well, I'm a child of the civil rights movement. So what I do in between interviews of people uh, who were foot soldiers, as I said before, I give flashes of my life. And it starts um, doing the Voting Rights uh, Act, and then it moves up until I'm an adult. So that's how the work works. So what I'm going to do now is read a little piece. I think it's very appropriate. Um, we're voting. So this is when my parents went to vote for the first time. This is called We Ready. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Big Mama and Little Mama, dressed in their Sunday go meeting clothes on a Tuesday, was a sight for my, that my sisters and I had never seen. Not only that, we didn't have to go to school that day. What'd she say about you not coming to work? Big Mama asked Little Mama. She decent enough, I reckon. I told her, I didn't ask her. Never had no trouble with them. Ruby and I cleaned the kitchen as they continued packing their lunch on the table in the middle of the room. Children were to be heard and not seen, was the law in our house. Ruby and I would commiserate later. The church ladies rolled in in their new silver 1964 Chevy Impala. Not only did Miss Pearl drive her own car, but she drove the bus for us colored children at, uh, in Clayton. And she was the first and only woman we knew who smoked three packs of camels a day. We were told I was in charge since I was the oldest. If we needed something, to go to see Mr. Gus Utsi, two houses down. Otherwise, we were to stay inside. Since we lived in the country, we weren't afraid. But I wondered how Mr. Gus Utsi could help us since he was in a wheelchair and only had one leg. Got them shivers bad, one of the church ladies said. They dashed in to show off their flowing fall outfits. Everybody was happy, wearing their lightweight autumn wools and matching hats tilted to one side of their face or out, uh, to the back of their faces. I had never seen the women so excited. They were giggling like schoolgirls. Even Big Mama was laughing and talking. Our teachers were giddy too. Voting for the first time, change had come to our little town in Louisville, Alabama, where fewer than a thousand citizens lived. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed into law, and most black people of legal age were heading to the polls for the first time. People who had been prohibited from voting before 
because of racial discrimination. By white folks working at the polls, asking stupid questions like, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? Or how many words are there in the Bible? But our civics teacher told us that this law was important and it was going to affect us more than anybody. She always read the second part first. And she banged her fist on the desk at the end. I never knew a time when civil rights was not a part of my life. Although I didn't understand all of the language, we knew times would get it better for the colors, we thought. But watching our mother, I wasn't sure how times were getting better. I never understood why she had to work every day, except a few Sundays, so she could go to church. We wanted her to stay home with her, with us. My sister and I knew our mother through work, not words, by touch, not silence. When little mom would go, would get home from work, bone tired, we sucked her feet in an old tin wash pan with hot water and Epsom salt. Ruby poured the hot water, I massaged her feet and patted them dry. Little mama slept through most of these sessions. She knew how to lay her head just right on the sofa so we could condition her scalp with Dixie Peach and brush her hair, her long curly hair that <coughs> either my sister or myself inherited. Helping our mother included sprinkling the starch clothes she took it to iron for another white family. She was paid a dollar for laundry basket. After the clothes were sprinkled, we put them in a plastic bag and placed them in the bottom of the refrigerator where the moist clothes waited on our tired mother. Afterwards, we fixed her a plate of whatever Big Mama had cooked. Sometime, she gave us, we gave her updates on the Perry Mason show from television. Often, she fell asleep before we completed the updates. When the women got back from voting, they were still happy and chatty. They saw folks they hadn't seen in years, and there was no trouble with the white folks at the polls. It seemed as though the world had tilted toward the right side of history. I had no other memory of our house feeling so joyful. Big Mama ordered us around with chores and homework, we helped little mama out as much as we could. Big mama moved in with us when grandpa, after Grandpa Alex died. I was four and Ruby was two. I saw Grandpa Alex maybe <coughs> twice. He was a tall, lanky man. I remember him kissing Ruby and me. His face was scratchy and he smelled like cigars. When little mama cleaned the white woman's house, big mama supervised the assembly line of direct domestic relations in our house. With Big Mama in charge at our house, del delicious scents always wavered through the air. I loved leaping off the bus, the school bus, and running into our warm and cozy house. Our yard grew too. Not like the white women's, our flowers was more splashes of yellow and whites here and there. But we kept our dirt yard swept with a homemade scrub room. Soon after Big Mama moved in with us, Little Mama mustered up enough courage to kick Mr. Tex out of our house and out of our lives. Little Mama mustered, mustered, up, mustered enough courage, excuse me. He was a tiny man with processed hair, copper-colored skin that shaded toward red in the summertime. Although he was never violent, after Friday paydays, we often didn't see him until he stumbled home on Sunday nights with that grocery or money. And the bickering would begin. Sometimes little mama would go to the sawmill or on payday to try to catch him before he got away with his paycheck. Finally, she put Mr. Tex's clothes out on the front porch in five round paper bags from the Winn Dixie. She told Mr. Pitt Walker deacon at the church to go by the sawmill to tell Mr. Tex that if he didn't come and get his clothes by Saturday, she was going to give them away. My father was little mama's second husband. He had been killed in a truck accident when I was a baby. 
He and Mr. Johnny Lee drove the gas truck for Cagney Brothers Gas Company. It exploded one day. Mr. Lee survived, but my father didn't. Since I never knew him, I never thought of him. What happened to him was like a dream that turned into a nightmare since we, his family, did not receive one penny from the gas company. Mr. Tech, my stepfather, was such a poor example of a father, I never imagined or could see what a good example looked like until maybe 50 years later. Then I met a man in South Carolina, Mr. John Candy. Mr. John Candy became the first person I interviewed in the book that I didn't know anything about. And he would have been that kind of father. Um, he worked for five presidents, starting with Johnson until Reagan. But the most interesting thing he uh, said to me was when he talked about the presidents, his favorite president was President Nixon. And it's a president, it's a Nixon that we don't know uh, because we have, we know what we saw on television and we know the impeachment and I'm not a crook. But Mr. Candy tells a different story. He tells the story that Nixon treated all of them, all of the black people, well. He gave them the highest raise possible and he knew all of their names. And if they needed anything, they could go directly to him. And he said, we were not political people. We just wanted to work. And he helped us to do that work. But the interesting thing was, after Nixon, after, um, Nixon was president, and when President Carter came in, he took all those things away, all those radios, and, which doesn't sound like much today, but in the 70s, it was a lot. <laughs> so there Mr. Canty was from South Carolina, uh, loving a Quaker president from, Cap South, from uh, California, but not liking a president from Georgia so much. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. You could do a lot better than that. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, thanks to the Virginia Festival of the Book for having me and to y'all for being here. I am beyond honored to be in conversation with Ethel Morgan Smith and Daryl Cumberdance and the Jefferson School. How lucky am I? Um, my new book, The Sisterhood, depends heavily on research in many archives. So here in Charlottesville, I just want to start by saying as an undergraduate at UVA in the 1990s, part of the way I put myself through school is by working in special collections. And that is where, under the tutelage of Felicia Johnson and Edward Gaynor, I learned to love and think seriously about archives. Um, so that matters for this project. I'm gonna to read to you a couple passages from the introduction to my book. Look at the picture in the opening pages of this book. Verda Mae Grosvenor with her regal height on the far left, Alice Walker, her coat on, bag slung across her body as if she's ready to walk out the door. Toni Morrison, unimpeachably cool in her leather duster and big gold jewelry. And June Jordan standing on the far right in a striped hippie dress and no coat. It's her apartment, so she's not dressed to walk out into the cold February evening in New York. Nana Maynard, seated on the far left, is the only other woman not in a coat, so maybe she planned to hang around after everybody left. And dead center in a crouching trio, um, we have Lori Sharp and Tazaki Shange and Audrey Ballard all smiling. Shange looking like she was caught in the middle of a laugh. Look at these women, sque um, squeezed together happily to fit in the picture, gathered around a framed portrait of Bessie Smith in a room with the high ceilings and architectural molding characteristic of pre-war apartments in New York. In warm light, but with shadows that show it is evening stretching into night. Every single one of the women looks straight into the camera. This photo, the Sisterhood 1977, has become the subject of legend among readers, scholars, and writers since it first appeared in print in Evelyn White's book, Alice Walker, A Life in 2004. That year, 20 years ago, was the first time I saw this picture when I was in graduate school 
and um, the brilliant scholar, mentor, beloved friend, Farrah Jonathan Griffin, told me there was a photo I absolutely had to see in this new book, so I rushed out to get a copy, opened to the gallery of black and white photos in the middle of the book, and saw this stunning image of powerful, smiling black women writers, some of whom I recognized right away, surely Alice Walker and Toni Morrison I recognized right away, but others whose faces and names were new to me. Evelyn White's caption describes the photo this way, quote, a group of black women writers in New York who met informally during the 1970s. So I stuck a post-it note on the page so the photo would be at hand anytime I wanted to take a look at it, and I started taking notes about this group that called themselves the Sisterhood. About five years later, the truly great black feminist literary scholar, institution builder, brilliant writer, Cheryl Wall, knew that this project was bubbling in the back of my mind and she said to me, hey Courtney, I think I saw something about the sisterhood in June Jordan's archives at Harvard Radcliffe. So a records request to that archive led me to an agenda, a printed mimeographed agenda and meeting minutes for one meeting of the group. And that was the kind of first thrilling clue that this group of women um, was not just a bunch of people who got together once in a while to do whatever, this was an organization that met on a regular basis to tackle specific issues. It was a couple years later that I made my first trip to Alice Walker's archives in Atlanta. Um, sitting in this ornate, high-ceilinged room at Emory University's Rose Library, I held a copy of this picture for the first time. And I flipped it over and saw on the back this handwritten note from June Jordan, quote, Dearest Alice, remember the days when you needed that double-breasted overcoat? Much love to you always. And the names of the women were there too, in purple ink and different handwriting, kind of scattered in different directions. This told me at least two things. First, that the sense of love visible in this photo was real, that's Jordan's word, love, and that it was lasting, she writes always. And second, that Alice Walker knew this group was important enough to go back after the fact and write everybody's name down on the back of the picture. Like anyone else who's looked at this image and recognized even only two or three of the women in it, I knew from the start it documented something important. This image circulates all the time now on all kinds of social media and websites. There are a few books that briefly describe it or include the photo. Um, it was over a decade after I first saw it, or maybe more like two, that I learned that the, that purple writing I talked about had misidentified this woman in the front um, as Audrey Edwards, when in fact it's Audrey Ballard. And so it was with the help of the poet Harriet Mullen and the writer Jackie Shine that the three of us kind of collaborated to confirm this was Audrey Ballard. Now, both women did work at Essence. They were both in the sisterhood. They were both important journalists, writers, activists. Um, but I mentioned this to say that a quick note dashed off on the back of an archival photo became a misnaming that was reproduced again and again in a story of the sisterhoods. So that's just a little bit. Um, to help us think about the way this group is really about more than just one iconic photo. This book, The Sisterhood, How a Network of Black Women Writers Changed American Culture, draws on the members' poetry, fiction, essays, meeting minutes, correspondence, biographies, and my research interviews with several members to uncover and narrate the everyday work of this group to secure publication, publicity, and recognition for black women writers. This image records so much more than one incredible Sunday in February of 1977. Rather, it's a window into the everyday collaborative work among black women writers that changed literary history. So as I've suggested to you, this group was just way more formal and structured than most writing about it suggests. Um, Jordan and Walker convened the first meeting in early 77, and from there, the group met at least one time a month for over two years. They collected, uh, they kept minutes of their meetings, and they collected dues. At the meeting, when they decided the dues would be $5, Audrey Lord pulled a $5 bill out of her pocket and paid it on the spot. I don't think anybody else paid on that first day, but Lord was ready to go with her dues. Um, the members took turns hosting meetings in their New York, uh, in their Manhattan and Brooklyn apartments. That's those of them who had a big enough space and enough chairs to host the group. Um, there were over 30 women who attended one or more meeting of the meetings of the sisterhood, and the rule was they could always bring one guest to any meeting as long as that guest was a black woman, writer, academic, journalist, or editor. In practice, this all, it also meant people sometimes brought their girlfriends or lawyers who were also black women intellectuals. 
Um, in practice, this meant, as the womanist theologian Renita Weems told me, they were, quote, really just high-achieving women who loved literature, feminists who loved literature who were trying to move the needle. They decided right off the bat to call themselves the Sisterhood because that term signified a kinship forged in political consciousness of the 1960s. Um, their name reflects their vision of collaboration rooted in love for self, for one another, and for black women's writing. So if you think of sisterhood, it's lateral rather than hierarchical. It's intimate and familial. It's about women, and it's black, and it's connected to political activism, right? So it's doing a lot of work right from the start. So they capitalized it, the sisterhood, from the very first meeting, and every single letter, agenda, minutes, and so on, uh, signaling that they thought of it as important right from the start. It's also true that sisterhood has a kind of openness. The group could have turned out to be many different things, a writing workshop, a press, a professional association, a book club. Over the two years they met, um, they worked through, figured out, and revised the sisterhood to meet a group that focused primarily on getting black women's writings published, read, reviewed, studied, and eventually taught in colleges and universities. They used their personal and affective bonds to struggle together to transform public culture. I'm gonna give you a little bit of context for that work and then I'll stop talking. Um, so the Sisterhood was a place to read and talk about black women's writings and for these women in New York to get a break from the overwhelming whiteness of their day job. As Margot Jefferson told me in 2018, quote, I cannot tell you what a relief it was to have this other life, meaning a life among black women writers because she and others were alone or one of the very few at white institutions. And by white institutions there, I mean from academic departments at colleges and universities, to publishing houses, to Newsweek, Time, and even Ms. Magazine, where members of the Sisterhood were working at all those places. The women of the Sisterhood strategized, as Margot put it, to formulate basic practical ways of getting through things and preserving your integrity. This space was a foundation for their literary and scholarly and journalistic and progressive work. So those are all Margo Jefferson's words, literary and scholarly and journalistic and progressive. And, um, she's an incredible cultural critic, journalist thinker, and has that kind of, not quite the lift every voice and sing momentum that Professor Dan had a moment ago, but in that thing. Um, so doing this work of advocating for black women's literature and liberation in hostile institutions, such as universities, magazines, newspapers, and book publishers. From its very modest beginnings, the sisterhood went on to set and achieve a number of ambitious goals, and they stopped meeting in early 1979 on pressure, as pressures on individual members and dissent within the group grew. For some, the demands of their paid professional work as writers, editors, and scholars became really difficult to balance with the unpaid or underpaid work of political, literary, and academic organizing. Class and generational differences and varying degrees of success in the literary marketplace also meant that different members wanted and needed different kinds of support from the group. It is also the case that um, as the sisterhood was successful in getting black women published, publicized, read, reviewed, and taught, black women writers were becoming more visible and struggling to control the terms of that visibility. So members of the sisterhood, for example, um, disagreed both in private and in print about Michelle Wallace's Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman, published at the very end of 1978, which was the subject of extensive media coverage and public debate. And so in, in a sense, these two periods of backlash kind of bookend the sisterhood on the front end to Endazaki's Shange's for Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Was Enough, which moves to Broadway in late 76, right before the sisterhood starts meeting. And Shange was in some ways the most famous member of the group in that period of time, and facing an enormous amount of backlash. So the sisterhood um, kind of circled around her as a form of protection. And then the group is bookended on the other end at the end of the 70s, with the backlash against Michelle Wallace's um, Black Macho. And so the kind of virulence of racism and sexism at the very dawn of the Reagan era, so this is, we're kind of chronological here, um, it, federal disinvestment, social welfare, and a sense of really despair after years without any one movement setting a clear agenda for black liberation all contributed to the sisterhood's dissolution. So what I mean to say is that this group came together in the late 70s over a decade after the moment Ethel just talked about when the last major civil rights um, legislation was passed 
And so they knew they were right to know that by the end of the 70s, the electoral and legislative politics were not the successful channels for transformation toward racial justice. And so they set their sights instead on culture, meaning trade publishing, magazines, newspapers, and higher education. Really against all odds, amid obstacles to collaboration from within and outside the group, the Sisterhood made substantive changes to the content of popular magazines, such as Essence and Ms. and Newsweek, um, and helped get black women's books published, reviewed, and recognized. They also developed intellectual communities and wrote books that would matter in popular and academic American culture for decades to come. So hopefully that can set the table. Thank you. Thank you. And now we get the chance, I'm sure you're all waiting for, for a conversation with these two ladies. Um, we've entertained questions from anybody here, um, and the people on the panel may question each other or comment. Just keep your questions and comments brief, and uh, we have somebody coming around with the microphone. Let, the microphone. Let, let her know uh, when you want to ask a question. And while we're waiting for her to get to someone, I'd just like to ask each of you, uh, what was the most unexpected or surprising person or voice that you had? Well, Mr. Kenji was not. I mean, I talked about just a little bit Because we... Well, who was the next person? <laughs> yeah, who was the next? <laughs> second place. And the second place was a woman named Virginia, uh, Blanche Virginia. Could, could you talk a little more into the mic? It's hard to hear. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Yes. The next person was a woman named uh, Virginia Franklin Moore uh, from the coal fields of West Virginia. When I met her, someone told me that I needed to meet her. She was in a nursing home in Clarksburg, West Virginia. So I went to see her, and she told me the story about her grandfather. Uh, who built a school for them because there was no school for them. But before that, uh, there was a school for the black children, students, but they had to be mixed race, or mulatto is what they call them at that time. So her parents didn't understand. Every day, they would send her home. They did this for, so they finally go to the school to see what the problem is. So the teacher, who uh, Ms. Moore described, is blonde and blue eyes, although not white. They did not want Mrs. Moore there because she was dark skinned. So they sent her home um, for about three weeks until finally the parents went to see. So this is when the granddad, Mr. Henry Franklin, decided that he would build a school for her and the other dark skinned children in, 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 in their community. And he did, so what he did, he took his house, they moved upstairs, and the school was downstairs. And they did this and did this until he invented um, a piece of equipment that could help with the coal mine, to get the coals out. And it was so known as the Franklin uh, tool. But he did all the right things. He, he took it downtown Clarksburg to two attorneys, white, that was the only attorneys around. And they took it from him. And when I, I remember, um, I remember talking about that, um, what happened to him, maybe on Facebook or something, I got so many notes from people about how the same thing, similar thing had happened in their families. And it was just heartbreaking. It took me a minute to get over it. And this is more, uh, when I first met her, she was 93, and she passed before I completed the problem. And she was so smart and so inquisitive, but she cried when she told me about the past when she was a little girl. And she said it affected her life so badly that it made, um, she said most of the decisions she made about her life after that were bad decisions because she was always haunted by not being wanted because she was a dark skinned little girl who loved nature and liked to ride horses. So that was, that was, it was, it wasn't as hard to write, but when I went to do the editing, that's when the pain came. Um, 
There were lots of surprises along the way, so I don't I don't know who was the um, I'm not sure who was the most surprising, but I want to say the most overwhelming thing about the interview process was the incredible generosity of former members of the sisterhood with me. And what I'm talking about is the first inter research interview I did for this book was with Margot Jefferson, who is a big deal. I missed the Pulitzer Prize winning credit author of two awesome and experimental memoirs that I highly recommend. And I didn't know how to do a research interview. I'm an English professor. So I'm like calling around my journalist friends and saying, what kind of app do you use? And like, what it makes for a good question. And I think um, Margo maybe even felt a little ambush, but she sat with me and helped teach me how to do a research interview. Um, and was just incredibly patient, but also that was 2018 corresponded probably at least once a month since then. She's kind of like staying on me, how's the book? Like, when's it coming? Did you get this? You know, so that kind of encouragement. Um, and also, when Ethel says thinking about foot soldiers and this more broadly imagined civil rights movement, I was really interested in interviewing the younger women members of the sisterhood that had done what they would call, what they do call, secretarial work. So in other words, um, of course, Morrison, Walker, and other members were important. They're very important members of the group. But there are many, many, many published interviews with both Morrison and Walker. But I interviewed the poet Patricia Spears Jones, who had served as correspondent secretary for the group. That's her term. Um, theologian Renita Weems, who took that over from them, from um, from Pat, and the hugely significant art historian, Judith Wilson, who had been the first secretary for the group and got so overwhelmed by it that she couldn't like go to grad school for art history and to keep up her tasks. So what I want to convey there is something that I knew but was deeply reinforced and that we know is true of the civil rights movement as well, that change is made by women's everyday, totally mundane, often <laughs> Do we have a question from the audience? Well, I have a question. I'm sorry I'm the, also the person. That, but, you know, that it's been my observation, having been in local politics for a long time, it's always, it's always the women. Could you comment on that? With me, with always the women? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is always the women. I maintain, I, I moved to Birmingham about seven years ago. And one of the things that hit me is I live less than two miles of direct road to the downtown, right? And so in the beginning, I go, wow, there are a lot of churches here, right? There are exactly 10 black churches in that less than two mile radius, okay? So one day, I was talking to my dog, let's see, we have to do something about this. Because I maintain, if the church paid taxes, the communities would be better, yes. number one. Number two, if black women left the church, it would not exist. Right. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things that I was talking about. And the other kinds of things about the women, I grew up in a family of sisterhood. You know, there was my mother, there was my grandmother, there was the church ladies. And if, for an example, I did, um, some work in Columbus, Mississippi, and they brought these little black kids there, and it was heartbreaking because the little kids were, they weren't bathed, and they looked like they were rolling in the sand, and they just brought them there. The sad thing was, so they can say they had brought something, they saw me and a couple of other black people, so they, you know, gathered toward us. They had not had a bath, they had no clean clothes on them. So I went back and started talking, who are, who's in charge of these people? So I sent them books, and I kept trying to get somebody's mother, you know, to talk to me. So some of the books came back because the kids didn't know the address. If the address was one thing, then the post office was another thing. I never could get anyone to talk to me. But I said, okay, I'm gonna keep doing this. This is worthwhile. Because at some point, someone, are going to someone is going to tell those children, you 
to stink, and that's going to break their heart. So I finally found someone, the person in charge, and I said, I will help you if you need, if we need to get them closed. I said, I can raise money to do that. So he said he would. So that's the kind of thing that women don't typically let happen. I can remember being, I was in a school in the spelling bee. My whole community came over to give me new shoes, new socks, you know, bows and ribbons in your hair. It was a community where we took care of each other, even though each other, we didn't have very much. But we would never have let those children go out like that. And I had been working on that. You'd think it would be sort of easy to do, but tracking down an adult. So then I went to the church after that, and I found someone. But it's, it's, a, it's a different world. But like I said, I was, I, mothers, uh, even in my life today, if I have a friend, typically I know that friend is probably gonna be a good friend if that friend has sisters. That I have come to believe that. Not that I don't have friends that don't have sisters, but I can always tell because there's a difference in terms of the treatment. But my mother, my, after my grandmother's husband died, grandpa, she moved in with us. So the church ladies would come. They would do this. Um, when the, uh, one of the chapters in the book is called Book Books <coughs> because the white kids used to throw the books in the trash. We weren't given new books. I think I was a junior in high school. But our parents would have to go dig those books out of the trash can that they knew that we were coming to get. But the fact of the matter is, those women would sit around the table and tell jokes and talk about how stupid they were, and we were the winners. They took those books and wrapped them in brown paper and put stenciled roses on them. We thought we had something, and we just thought they were stupid. So that's a form of sisterhood, too. So does that answer so much? Other questions? Yes, sir. Do you want to write like a bit? It's here. It's just bigger. This sums more of the novel editing to be a biographical or a historical aspect of it. Which suffers more of the novel editing? Is it the uh, for publishing? Is it the uh, the the biograph the biography? or the historical aspect of it. Which suffers more in the editing, is that what you said? Yes, yes. I think the trick is to let neither of them Just suffer. suffer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which means knowing the story you want to tell and sticking yeah. to it. Well, the thing is, like one of the things I knew when I was putting this book together, that there was one woman I was going to write about, and her name is Ann Cole Love. And she's beginning to get some attention now. Um, Ann Cole Lowe is a fashion designer, black woman from Clayton, Alabama, where I grew up. Um, she was designer of Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress, the most uh, photographed wedding dress in the country. So her, her, one of my high school friends' father was her first cousin. So we always knew about her. They would joke around and say, Annie can make anybody pretty, no matter how ugly they were. Annie, give them over to Annie. So I always heard about this mysterious woman named Annie. She was born in Alabama in 1898, but the family, the women, got a contract to do the governor's, um, the inaugural the ball for the governor, Montgomery, and the daughters, and that was 14-year-old Annie, her grandmother, and her mother did that. And so she stayed there, and one of the things she said, for some people this will be enough. But for me, my, my, I have always wanted to be in New York, and she did. But for her to just be getting attention now is just amazing. So the research, so there wasn't a lot of research, because all the research, it, it always focused on the candidates, right? So I started talking to, I started with my high school friend, then she told me that she used to live in Dothan. I tracked those people down. Uh, then I found out that she is buried in Queens, unlike the rest of her family. So I just kept talking to people who, if they didn't know her, they knew her relatives. And that's research, too. It, it, yeah. it, it, it's hard research, but you get it when you talk to people. And I think she died in 1981, Ann Colo. 
and some of her gowns um, are on, uh, on permanent display at the Metropolitan. So not only did she uh, design, uh, uh, design gowns for the Kennedys, and when they talk about it in the books, it drove me crazy. They act like she just dropped out of the air somewhere. You know what I mean? Where did she come from? Well, she was friends with Jacqueline Kennedy's um, mother. She made her gowns for her second husband, and she had made all of their coming out gowns. So she didn't just drop out of the air, but she also did work for the DuPonts. Um, she did work for the, um, uh, the Roosevelt's, the Rockefellers. She made Olivia de Heaven's uh, gown when she got a, uh, when she got a, um, <laughs> I'm almost at a full surprise, yeah. <laughs> Oscar. Yeah, when she got an Oscar, but she never got credit for it. She was never given credit uh, for it. And one time, she, when she spoke, she said very important things. She wrote a letter to Jacqueline because there had been an article in Ladies Home Journal, remember that magazine? And it said the maker of the dress was a Negro seamstress. So she was not happy. She wrote the letter. I have the, le I have the letter. And it says, Dear Mrs. Kennedy. So by then she's the first lady. It's 1961, 62. Anyway, uh, she said, I have lived by all of your rules. It has not been important to me to mention your name. I know what I did. You know what I did. She said, but I refuse to be called a Negro seamstress. Uh, yeah, something like that. Well, of course, uh, no one answered her, so she calls. And the secretary says, oh, Mrs. Kennedy has been out and has been away. But the other most important thing she said, she had, she had bad husbands, you know. She was a very beautiful woman and she had some money. Um, so she left the second husband and this is what she said. She married the first husband when she was 15, the family born and during that time. This is, we're talking about 1917, 1918. So the family felt that that would protect her if she uh, were married. So they were for that. Of course, it did not. So when she left that husband, she said, I am leaving my husband today. My grandmother was a slave. My mother was close enough. I will not be a slave. Yeah. And, yeah. and she did it one other time. Uh, she had bad luck. Bad husbands, people, bad luck. So anyway, uh, her pipes burst in Harlem two weeks before this big wedding of the of Olivia Kennedy's, right? So she ended up having to pay $2,000 more, hire more people. Granted, Jacqueline Kennedy paid her $300, maybe $500 for her dress. But anyway, she takes the overnight train from uh, New York to um, Newport, where the wedding was. She goes to the door with all the stuff. The butler comes to the door and says, you'll have to go around the back. And she says, if I have to go to the back door, there will be no wedding. <laughs> so, yeah. so she would, there were these moments that, you know, she said this, when she said something, they were very powerful. And all of the people I talked to repeat the same story to me. So oh, this has got to be right. But anyway, but she was, there was an article in her last year in the New Yorker. Uh, there's an exhibit. She has started to get some attention uh, now. So what I hope to do is to, I did a lot of research, much more than this chapter can hold. So it is my hope that I can do a, a, a full biography, a full of biography on her. She deserves it. Sure. Well, I want to say that chapter is one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that, so, I mean, my work is, my book is a little bit different in the sense that this is not a biography and this is not a group biography as much as people um, might have liked it to be or editors might have liked it to be. This is a story of the group. So I am not speaking for anyone. All of these women are incredibly um, brilliant writers, thinkers, you know, can speak for themselves and many of them are still actively speaking for themselves in print and in their classrooms and in public spaces. This is really an interpretive cultural history of a specific collaboration um, and it kind of ripples out that we're outward from there. So for me, in terms of the editing and 
um, like working with an editor and getting feedback. It was kind of about holding the line on that. So these women documented their work together, when I say agendas and meeting minutes and so on. So and not everything is for everybody. And there is a lot of stuff that they chose not to put in these meeting minutes. And there are things that happened at, at the meeting that are not in the minutes. There are things they told me that were okay to include in the book and things they told me that were not okay to include in the book. <laughs> and so it's about um, holding that line because this is really about their work. And so, yeah, so not, right, not slipping into, right? Like, I don't really, it's not really important who anybody was married to or slept with. Um, that's not really part of the story that this book tells. This is about writing. Well, you tell it a bigger story. Yes. yes. My story is big, but it's, it's personal and it becomes big. Exactly. Yeah. And so kind of hang, knowing, I mean, just knowing that, right? Yeah. And knowing what the, the arc and the parameters mm -hmm. of the project are. Uh, yeah. There's people women who have a little more power sometimes if they went in with their manuscripts, but we know historically there's a right. problem of dealing with editors. We have no idea what a rich white set is. For a particular book until many years later, because of the editing that went into that book. And I personally have had so many experiences I could tell you about, about fighting about whether to capitalize a word or not, uh, about a number of issues, about using a particular title and so forth. So the battle is just beginning. Absolutely. When they, they agree to look at your work. Next question, please. Um, I'm just curious, Ethel, how you found and how you chose people to write about. Well, I started off like with a hundred people, and then things started to happen. You know, for an example, I was going to interview in the, uh, the, the uh, well, she was sick, and she could talk to me. I was going to interview uh, Fred Shuffle. He had dementia, you know, so his family didn't want to talk to me, or, you know. So. As people fell, I continued to talk about my project, and then other names would come up. That's how I got Mr. Candy. There was another man in South Carolina who had played professional uh, football, and he had come home to help, you know, help his parents stay with them, do that kind of thing. Um, he went to the YMCA. He was beaten so bad, he could not talk. He could not, you know how we know John, Lewis spoke with a stutter. His was probably five times worse, and he did not want to talk to me. So I wrote him a letter and said, "Well, we don't have to talk. Maybe we can just go back and forth on, uh, on the computer." You know? And he said, "No." He said, "I do not want to remember that time again, and I will have to relive it if we do this. I cannot do it." And he wished me good luck, and he was sorry, and I totally understood. But I just kept talking to people. I just talking to people about different people. And sometimes it boils down to pure access. You know, Susan Cole Perry was someone I had known 40 years ago. And it occurred to me, oh, I need to talk to her. You know, she was Mrs. C's. She used to call, Echo, come up. I was in Atlanta at the time, and she was in DC. Come up, Mrs. C is doing this, and Mrs. C. So that's what everybody called her. So I just, I'm talking to everyone who would talk to me, and people would give me ideas about people. Fred Gray was another one I was supposed to interview, and it just fell through. Um, just so many people. Um, and what I try to do, I learned from my first book, is to interview the oldest people first, because they died. But in this case, I had some younger people who died. Um, Valerie Moore died, and Randall Kennedy died. And I had done one interview with Randall, but I didn't think I had enough to do the whole chapter. And both of those people were in their 50s. So, but for the most part, it, it is, the, like Mrs. Moore died. Uh, I went away that summer for a residency, and she was going to turn uh, 99. And I said, okay, I'm going to call you on your birthday, send you flowers. I didn't tell us in a while, I just said. And, I said, and she said, well, I'm going to be make it to 100. And I said, well, we'll have a big party. Well, of course she did. She died while I was away. So uh, all of there's a lot of pain in, 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 in this kind of work. Uh, I, was some, I was at Monroeville, the home of Harper Lee and Sue Dakota. And one woman raised her hand and asked me, why didn't I? I have a two undergraduate degree in business and economic. 
And she said, well, why don't you um, write about women economists? And I said, I don't care about women economists. <laughs> I don't write about things or people that I don't care about or I don't know, you know what I mean? I could care less about women economists. It was a horrible major. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> if you're going to do something like this, what we're doing, you're going to need your heart and soul because you're going to have some stormy, stormy days. So I don't, you know, my son was growing up, he was the same age as a lot of those boys who were murdered in Atlanta uh, during that time. And, I, and at some point, I was going to write about it from a parent's point of view. And then I just decided I didn't want to do, I didn't want to relive that. It was a horrible, horrible nightmare. So I don't write about things I don't want to write about. But no, I don't care about women economists or male economists or any other economists. Uh, like I said, what I write about are people who've been neglected. Their voices have not been told before. Uh, that's what I try to write about. Does that mean? Okay. Other question, anyone? Well, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful, wonderful audience, and this has been quite an exciting opportunity uh, for me. Since I think we do have a few more minutes, I just want to say a word or two because I probably can tell you more about themselves and the work they did and they talked about their work. But they're such uh, interesting and important individuals uh, and scholars. Ethel and I are members of another sisterhood. Um, I knew you were going to talk about it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to talk about it. I'm just mentioning that we know each other. We're part <laughs> of the Wintergreen uh, Collective. Um, and everywhere, many people have groups of different kinds, not just writers. And these groups have uh, sustained us so much. Uh, I've known Ethel since the beginning of her writing career and have had a part in many of her books. And I am so happy when you get this, you read this blurb on the back. Uh, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just meeting Courtney for the first time. And before I actually met her in person, I met her through her book. Now, I'm a slightly older scholar. And, you know, I sometimes tend to think I've forgotten more than younger scholars like <laughs> Courtney will ever know. But her book taught me a lesson. I had lived, about, I had lived through so much that she wrote about, but I discovered so many more things about many of the experiences that she recounts in this book. So you are all going to and buy these wonderful books. We want to support the booksellers who are here too, because they're an important part of this festival through the years. Uh, we want to support booksellers and bookstores wherever we can. We want to buy books wherever we can, but we have an opportunity today uh, to buy these books, and the booksellers are around here. I asked them back and put them back here. You want people to pass by you. Yes, you know, yeah. a special effort, but make that effort please, and go there. Don't forget also. I did point it the wrong way. No, no, you're great. Oh. You're great. The book signing is there. And so the, the book signing is there, and the book signing is there. Thank you very much. And also, have you gotten the evaluation forms yet? The evaluation forms are being passed to you. Please be sure to uh, sign them. It's important to uh, get the evaluations in. Um, your evaluation will have an impact on 